the fundamental basis for aristocracy is the Trinity. God is an aristocracy. Every single time Jesus talks about or talks to his father and his relationship to his father, it is an aristocratic relationship. Jesus was the most obedient conformist man in the history of the world. He says, I come into this world not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. My teaching is not mine, it is his who sent me. Here, the, the most creative and original man who ever lived was at the same time the most aristocratic conformist. In fact, in the Church Fathers, you have this debate between the, uh, I wouldn't call them the egalitarians and the aristocrats, but those who pointed to the equality passages and those who pointed to the subordination passages. And they had to get them both together because Christian theology is like science. It's a hypothesis that covers all the data. But the two sets of data seem to contradict each other. Just as in physics, uh, light is a wave, light is a particle. It's a funny thing. You've got to get them both together. You can't just say one. So uh, Arius emphasized the subordinationist passages and says that, well, Jesus must be subordinate ontologically to the Father. He must be a creature, the first of creatures. No, nope, that's a heresy. But uh, to emphasize the equality passages uh, tends to a kind of monism, uh, not accepting the distinction of persons. How do you get together the absolute equality of the three persons of the Trinity and yet the total subordination of the Father to the Son and of the Spirit to both the Father and the Son? Well, that was tricky, but that theological basis of connecting equality and subordination, connecting the egalitarian or democratic principle with the aristocratic or hierarchical principle is the ultimate foundation because God is the ultimate paradigm for everything else real. To say that God is the creator means that everything he creates resembles him in some way. Well, this is one of the most fundamental ways just as God is both equal and unequal, so everything in the universe in some sense is equal and in some sense is unequal. So you look at the whole universe and you see, well, everything exists. Everything's got that active existence. Here's a subatomic particle. And here's a dog. And here's an angel. And they're very, very different. Uh, the subatomic particle doesn't have any consciousness or spirit. The dog has a consciousness but not a spirit. The angel is a pure spirit without any matter. And yet each of them has that active existence. Each of them has been created by God. That's a radical equality. There's a, a prison memoir. I think this is in Valadares, the uh, <coughs> Cuban prisoner under Castro, but I'm not sure. Uh, he's, in a, he's in a prison, and he's uh, in solitary confinement, and I think he makes friends with a spider, and the spider dies, and he it despairs because he's got no life form now to, uh, to commune with. And then he notices a rock that's a little loose, and he picks up that rock, and he says, you know, rock, you're my friend. You've got something that I've got. You're a creature of God, and so am I. And I can see God in you simply because you exist. You're not useful to me. You're, you're cold and hard and I can't eat you and you're part of my prison. But you exist. You're real. And so am I. And I can, I can revel in that common reality that, that shows the creator. I can see the presence of God in this rock. Well, that, that, that's radical equality. On the other hand, everything in the cosmos is in a hierarchy. Uh, man is superior to animals. Higher animals are superior to lower animals. Animals are superior to plants. Plants are superior to minerals. Angels are superior to human beings. If you don't know that, you don't know angels. I'm suspicious of these angel books because angels always show up as chums and they're, they're, they're comfortable. But in the Bible, when angels show up, people fall at their feet and say, uh, oh, I shall worship you. The first thing the angel says is, don't, don't worship me and don't fear me. Angels are superior to us. There's nothing in the cosmos no species in the cosmos that's not superior or inferior in some way to another species. Sometimes it's mutual. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, a cheetah is faster than a lion, but a lion is stronger than a cheetah. Uh, you know, women are prettier than men, and men are stronger than women. Uh, but 
there's always superiority and inferiority in the cosmos. And since human life is part of the cosmos, human life too is an aristocracy. Uh, what do I mean by human life? The biological given fact that we are a member of the species, Homo sapiens, yes, but also how we choose to live. Human life goes by free choice. And even that is an aristocracy. How? Well, there's authority and there's obedience. Any kind of political structure, even democracy, has authority and obedience. Here is the regime, even if it's a democratic regime, and it has authority. We elected it, and now we obey its laws. Oh, but I'm equal to the, the lawmaker because I am the lawmaker. True, but I still obey that authority. When Christianity came into the world, it liberated three kinds of people, uh, children, women, and citizens, by declaring that they're all made in God's image. But it did not deny the traditional hierarchy. Citizens obey your rulers. Children obey your parents. And even wives obey your husbands, although they're mutual. Husbands must submit to their wives as well. Uh, authority and obedience, uh, down and up, vertical. The very structure of the family is an aristocracy. Uh, give children an equal vote to parents and you have chaos, obviously. Now, if the local community is an extension of the family, and if the larger community is an extension of the local community, and if the state is an extension of the larger community, then what is true of the family must be true of the state as well. And even Aristotle says this. Aristotle, unlike Plato, likes democracy. But Aristotle, unlike Plato, takes the family as the mediating institution between the individual and the state. There's three parts of his politics. Uh, one part is not in the politics at all, it's the ethics, individual ethics, the Nicomachean ethics. And then he begins his politics with the household and household management. And then he goes to the state, seeing that uh, there is a, a natural analogy among the three. Well, by logical argument, if, if the family is natural and everything in nature is an aristocracy, then the family is an aristocracy. And if the state is an extension of the family, then the state too is a natural aristocracy. And certainly the church is an aristocracy, not a democracy. The church that Christ the Christ of the New Testament founded is a church that has authority. He says to the apostles, I give you authority to teach in my name. He who hears you, hears me. Well, if Jesus Christ were to appear literally and physically in this room and give you a command, would you say, well, uh, Jesus, we're going to have to vote on that. You know, we're not, we're not into this lordship stuff anymore. We're, we're Americans. I don't think so. Take some area of human life that doesn't seem to have anything to do with politics and see if this principle still holds. Take, take art. Isn't art inherently aristocratic? Well, if there are no objective standards of beauty, no. If there are, yes. If one work of art can be more beautiful or more whatever art is supposed to be than another, then art is inherently aristocratic. At the beginning of the abolition of man, Lewis used this, this analogy between art and politics and deliberately uh, starts with, with, with art. Here is Coleridge and two tourists at a waterfall. And one of the tourists says, it's pretty. And the second tourist says, no it isn't, it's sublime. And Coleridge, the great literary critic, agrees with the second tourist and not the first. And Lewis agrees with Coleridge and he expects us to agree with him. Why? Because they're discriminating because the first tourist is wrong. Waterfalls aren't pretty or cute or sweet or cutesy. Great cataracts are sublime. There's something out there that calls to us to respond in a certain way. And if we have any aesthetic sensibility at all, we, we know that art is inherently discriminating. Well, if that's true even of art, which is notoriously subjective, you know, the slogan, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, maybe that's 50% true or 90% true, but it's not 100% true, then much more is it going to be true of ethics. 